The views that we discuss are not necessarily reflective of Russia Christie National, but we consider them important views to discuss in the context of the debate uh, or the topic that we're discussing. So just a disclaimer up there up front. And by extension, they're not necessarily my own personal views either. Um, in fact, if I've done my job well tonight, you won't know what my personal view is. Um, can't guarantee I'm that good though. So uh, if you have a handout, uh, if you don't have a handout or if someone near you has a handout, you can get a digital copy or a, you can scan the little QR code on the back for a digital copy. Uh, I don't know where that stack ended up, but if we can distribute the rest of them around. Okay, great. Are there are a couple extras? All right. Yeah, please, please do, Ada. Thank you. That'd be great. Okay. Um, but there's a little QR code on the back that, uh, that you can scan. Now, this handout is not necessarily going to follow the exact structure of what we're doing. It's more of a reference to help you keep track of all the terms that we're talking about. Okay. Alrighty, so this semester, we are discussing the good news of the kingdom of God, which is referred to as the gospel. The gospel message, in short, is that humanity, collectively and individually, has rejected God, who is the source of life and goodness. And in so doing, we have become inheritors of death, evil, and misery. However, not willing that we should perish, God entered into a covenant of grace to deliver humanity out of this state of misery by means of a redeemer. This covenant, begun with the Hebrew people, reached its fulfillment in the person of Jesus, who, being God incarnate, lived a perfect life, was crucified for the sins of his people, and overcame death in his resurrection, and now offers forgiveness and fullness of life to all who repent and believe. I think that's good news indeed. Our focus this evening is on the other side of good news, and that is the fate of those who reject the kingdom of God. Now, I choose this phrasing very carefully because we're not discussing the fate of those who have never heard the message of the kingdom of God. That's what we discussed uh, last week. And secondly, we're not discussing the fate of those who are currently seeking out the truth of the matter. If Christianity is correct, then God is himself truth and a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Rather, what we mean is those who in the final analysis spurn all forms of divine grace and ultimately actively reject the kingship of Jesus himself. And I hasten to add that nobody in here actually meets that description. Spiritual journeys are sort of these long winding pathways with unexpected turns uh, in the future. And no matter where you are, I'm glad that at least my spiritual journey and yours uh, can intersect tonight. So with that in mind, what are we discussing? Our first point of controversy. So I don't know exactly what the makeup is here, but I'm probably going to step on everybody's toes at least once. So here we go, here, here we go. So here's what we are discussing. Christian eschatology is, uh, or otherwise known as end times, um, is a massively complicated topic. So I have reduced this down to just the bare essentials that every Christian will agree upon. So as a short primer, um, Christian eschatology, or again, just end times, states that at a discrete time in the future, Jesus will return to earth, all humanity will be resurrected and judged by the Son of Man. Now, those that die before this event enter what's called the intermediate state, which is a spooky sort of body and soul separated, no one really knows what's going on there, um, but whatever it is, one's existence is preserved uh, until the resurrection and judgment. Now, Jesus previews, previews this judgment in Matthew 25, stating that to the unrighteous, the Son of Man will say, depart from me, uh, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food, a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, you did not clothe me, for as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is Matthew 25. Now, many terms are given to uh, the, uh, this final state, Gehenna, Hades, etc., but collectively the label is hell. So here I have a little chart that kind of shows you that we have now, the intermediate state, and then we're talking about what's going on uh, down here. Now, the problem of hell is multifaceted, but at its root, the core objection, at least the core philosophical objection, is that hell is unjust for no amount nor severity of evil committed in a finite life could warrant such an infinite, eternal, unending, unyielding punishment. This objection has several assumptions baked into it, um, all worth examining before responding. So I have here, this is our interlocutor, uh, Alvin the Atheist, Carol the Christian. I have it sort of set up as a formal um, uh, structure. Um, essentially, it comes down to these two premises, premises two and three. First, that hell is an infinite punishment that is equally administered to all who are condemned. And uh, item number three, infinite punishment for finite sin is unjust. So we're gonna focus primarily on those two, uh, those two items. Now our roadmap tonight is we're gonna first exegetically survey a few biblical views of hell, three in particular, and their scriptural warrant. Second, we're going to um, 
so, or, sorry, we'll provide an overview and then look at the scripture. Um, and then we're going to philosophically probe uh, these views for their response to this objection. Now, much of my content uh, tonight is coming from these two books, which is Hell and Divine Goodness by James Spiegel and The Problem of Hell uh, by Jonathan Quanvig. Very readable. I think they're both less than like 200 pages. Now, you might be surprised at my plural terminology there, because I said there are views of hell. And many of you probably until right now thought there was just the one. Well, how many are we talking about? Well, according to David Powis, there are at least 12 that are defended in the contemporary li uh, Christian literature. Fortunately for us, they can be largely grouped into three main streams of thought, each following an early church father. I'm going to buzz through these quick, and then we're going to summarize them, and then I'll pause for questions, okay? So first, the uh, primary one that everyone knows is St. Augustine of Hippo. So he articulated that in that uh, penal and everlasting punishment, the soul is justly said to die because it does not live in connection with God. But how can we say that the body is dead seeing as it lives by the soul? For it could not otherwise feel the bodily torments which are to follow the resurrection. So we're going to refer to this view as tormentalism or eternal torment or eternal conscious torment or some variation uh, thereof. So you can see here that on this little chart, the uh, green arrow, which describes the new creation and the fate of the redeemed, runs exactly parallel to the eternal conscious torment arrow. There's no end to the life of the redeemed. There's no end to the torture and torment of uh, the condemned. So that's our first view. The second view, uh, following St. Irenaeus of Lyon, he articulated that those outside of Christ, quote, are deprived of his gift, which is life eternal, and not receiving the word of incorruption, they remain in mortal flesh and are the debtors of debt, of death, sorry, not having received the antidote of life. God alone has immortality, per 1 Timothy 6.16. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, per John 3.16. And so in short, immortality is conditional on accepting Christ. Those that reject Christ remain mortal and subject to complete death in body and soul. So we refer to this view as conditionalism. Now, our third and final view is uh, following St. Or, sorry, let me, if you notice here, the arrow doesn't continue for eternity. At some point, it stops because the uh, condemned in hell eventually are obliterated. They cease, they cease to exist in that sense. Okay, so our third and final view, uh, following St. Gregory of Nyssa, he articulated that the purpose and nature of hell was for universal restoration of humanity. He said, God's end is one and one only, that when the complete whole of our race shall have been perfected from the first man to the last, some having afterwards in the necessary periods been healed by fire to offer to every one of us participation in the blessings which are in him. So this universal reconciliation view, in short, we'll refer to it as universalism. In his view, hell is a sort of universal purgatory. Everyone that goes there is eventually purified uh, and cleansed of whatever sin <clears throat> or evil is within them, and eventually all of creation is redeemed back to God. Now, here's a quick little summary of all of those uh, three views. Um, we're going to get into the critical analysis here in a minute, where we're going to actually say, are these right or wrong? But first, let me just pause and ask, are there any sort of just clarification questions about what is and is not the thing? Yes, Sam. Can you go back to the oxygen slide real quick? Yes. OK, uh, yeah, so the intermediate state, uh, an unbeliever dies, and then their soul is preserved. So yeah, so I'm not going to make any comments about the intermediate state at all. That's uh, a, a giant open question in Christian theology. What this is talking about is all of human. What all views agree on: all of humanity will be resurrected, reconstituted in body and soul, and then the judgment. That's what's going on in Matthew 25. And uh, then whatever happens after that, those are that's what we're talking about. It is implied that the soul can exist indefinitely without a body. Um, I I'm not gonna comment on that. All, 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 no, all of these views have different views on, on the intermediate state. None of them are directly committed uh, you to that. Let me go back to that. Yeah, another qu comment? Is anybody hold to like universalism for free without any uh, purification or punishment? Just like uh, go straight there? I, I mean, some, some do, but n none of the early church fathers do. So. Cool. That I know of, at least. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, Ben has a comment. Yeah. I was just going to ask, how does, how would Gregory's of Nyssa's view differ from, um, if he held it, differ from um, that of purgatory as like for, for believers? Ah, so, a great clarification question, especially for the Protestants in the room that might not be clear on this. Purgatory, I'm radically simplifying this, purgatory is um, a subset of heaven, 
more or less. People that go to purgatory are, quote, in heaven. Anyone who, in, in Catholic theology, you can correct me on that, right? But in, in this view, uh, Gregory is saying that there, technically there isn't a, a hell, properly speaking, but rather there is just purgatory, like everyone would go there in, in, in that sense. Wouldn't be exactly true. That would be anachronistic on multiple accounts, but anyway. Yes? Uh, that, uh, does that include... Uh, the devils, the demons, and Satan? And oh, we're leaving that a completely open question. Completely open. This is just talk about human beings for now. Okay, great. Okay, so for the sake of time, um, there are three views here. Uh, we're going to have to cut one of them just for the sake of time. We're going to cut universalism. I'm sorry, but it's kind of its own barrel. How dare you? I know. <laughs> it's just sort of its own barrel of monkeys. It's, it's, it's a really big deal. There are a lot of complicated questions there. Um, but... Uh, if you want to discuss it at REVS or whenever we're done with the prepared content and go to the open discussion, glad to do it. There are some very interesting philosophical issues with that um, uh, in place. Okay, so now let's let's turn to this question. So why is there all this uh, disagreement between the views? And just like the philosophical problem, the exegetical controversy is enormously multifaceted. But at its root, the simple uh, or the the core problem is that there is no single authoritative literal description of hell in scripture by which to control all the other descriptions of hell. And so as such, the uh, literary portraits of hell that are provided are highly picturesque and metaphorical, sometimes even contradictory. Hell is described as both outer darkness and a place of fire. How can there be fire and darkness? Incomprehensible. So whenever we talk about metaphors, so clearly they're not being literal in, in this sense, but whenever we talk about metaphors, it's not just enough to say, oh, this is metaphorical. You have to actually break it apart. So a metaphor consists of uh, three parts. Again, there's a, I'm radically simplifying this. There are a thousand different views on what a metaphor constitutes, but I think this is the easiest way. So first you have the target, which is the thing that is being described. You have the referent, which is your point of uh, comparison. And then you have the sense. The sense is uh, the similarity between your uh, target and referent. So for example, uh, we would say that Jesus is the lamb. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb in the sense that Jesus and uh, lambs are both sacrifices not in the sense that they both have four legs. Um, so returning back to the uh, topic of hell, a common reference that's brought up is fire. That's what Jesus talks about. But is that fire in the sense of a painful, tormentuous fire, in the sense of a fire that is destructive, or in the sense of a purifying fire? So it is with all the images of hell. They all have these similar reference, but they have different senses. And so with that in mind, we're, then, we're gonna look at uh, some of these passages in more detail. Um, let me pause one more time. Any clarification on this? Okay, yeah, pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's look at three passages of Scripture that uh, come up a lot in, in this debate. Uh, first is the uh, parable of Dives and Lazarus from Luke chapter 16. So a parable of Jesus that frequently comes up in this debate is the one of the rich man and the poor man who end up in Hades and Abraham's bosom, respectively. The rich man cries for Lazarus uh, to cool the tip of his tongue with water, for he is, quote, in anguish in this flame. Abraham, uh, who is comforting Lazarus, says this is not possible because there is a, quote, great chasm fixed between the two. So this comes up a lot. Well, you know, you got a pretty a lot of inferences made about uh, what hell is like. Now, here's where I'm going to probably step on some toes. This passage is actually irrelevant to the debate for three primary reasons. First, it's a parable. And so that makes it kind of the wrong genre. Parables like we said, they're universally not to be taken literally, um, and especially the settings of parables are usually not to be taken as didactic descriptions of what's going on. Secondly, uh, it's the wrong, uh, the wrong message. If you look at the broader context, the conclusion that Jesus draws from this parable is not, therefore, this is what hell is like. He says, therefore, if, uh, they, if they will not listen to uh, Moses and the prophets, neither would they listen if someone came back from the dead. He's not making a didactic point about what the afterlife is about. And thirdly, this is the real sinker for it, even if I was wrong on both of those points, and I imagine most of you think that I am, even if I was wrong about that, if you take this completely literally, completely didactic, you'll notice that the rich man and Lazarus um, are still referring to life that goes on outside of their uh, existence, meaning that the, all the story, the entire story, even if you take it literally, is happening over here with the intermediate state. And for that reason, it's actually compatible with all three of the views that we talked about. So for that reason, it doesn't actually have any substantial weight one way or the other. Okay, now that is possibly controversial. So are there any comments or questions about, about this passage in general and my analysis uh, as well? Yes, Jackson. Where do we get the idea of an intermediate state? You know, we're always told that we go to heaven or hell when we die. 
Ah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so part of that comes from, um, well, I, you have a sociological answer to that as to where uh, the sort of binary comes from. Um, in general, I, I would just say it's just bad Christian theology. Most people don't have a theology of resurrection. They just have a theology of uh, you know, fire insurance or what have you. Um, so in, in this case, uh, this, in fact, actually, I'm glad you brought this up. Interpreting this passage in that way reinforces that false dichotomy that when you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell, and that's the hope of Christianity. Uh, what, what's happening there is it's more of a logical inference. Christianity does teach of a resurrection uh, in the future, a reconstitution of body and soul, and it doesn't matter what you interpret soul to mean, a reconstitution of those things. So then the question is, if you die here today, and at some point you'll be reconstituted, what happens in between? How do you maintain a personal identity through this period? And there have been a variety of different answers to that. Uh, the most standard response has been, well, there's an immaterial component of you called a soul that God preserves in being after your death. And so that's what intermediate state uh, is referred to as. Again, that's a huge can of worms um, and a lot of other diverse views, but. Anyway. So what would be like scripture that points to the intermediate state? Uh, you could look, it's, it's all very shady, uh, which is actually a really good pun because uh, whenever you refer to, whenever uh, people are referred to post-death, uh, they're referred to as shades in the Old Testament. Um, so for example, uh, here's a really obscure passage. There's a passage where uh, in 1 Samuel, I believe, maybe 2 Samuel, I can't remember, Saul, uh, the king of Israel, uh, goes to the witch of Endor to summon uh, the spirit of Samuel, the prophet. Uh, and she succeeds in summoning uh, this, uh, his spirit. And Saul, uh, Samuel speaks from beyond the grave and says, um, Saul, you fool, what have you done? Um, that would be potential evidence. Again, some people say maybe that wasn't actually uh, Samuel, but maybe, I don't know. That would be one of those things. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, Paul, yeah, Paul makes some references to, uh, to, be with, uh, to be dead and to be with Christ is better or something to that effect. I can't remember. State, you're just waiting for judgment. Uh, yes. Again, I, this is the purpose, but yes, that's that's right. I'm not making. I'm not going to take any stance on this. It's a highly controversial, independent question. The, the facts of the intermediate state are controversial. Yes. But the idea of the intermediate state is not controversial. Not not. Well, by by definition, the intermediate state is just defined as the period between your death and the resurrection. Okay. It's just defined but, that way. Like everyone, everyone has died. It's just there waiting for their judgment. Possibly. It's not like when you, okay. It's not like, you know, what I always thought is like you die and then at that moment you face judgment. Yeah, that is not what the Bible teaches. Because that's, remember, Jesus says in Matthew 25 uh, that all will appear before the Son of Man resurrected. Um, and uh, the, those that are righteous will uh, inherit eternal life and those that are not uh, will inherit eternal punishment. So much controversy, Ben. Go ahead. I'm going to come to the defense with your punching on this. Okay. And say that um, <laughs> to, to help people understand why this is such a convoluted issue. Aquinas, who's one of the greatest theologians of all time, also in some ways punched on this issue. So this isn't an issue that Zach alone is punching on. Um, <laughs> there are many, many other people who also punt on the thing. Um, the most uh, important thing for our discussion here is that it's pre-resurrection. Correct. Okay. Correct. This is not a description of the final state. It's, first of all, it's a parable. It's not a didactic teaching about anything related to the afterlife. But even if you don't buy that, because that's kind of a hard sell, I, I understand. Even if you take this literally, um, it still doesn't actually tell you anything about the final state. Okay. Sorry. All righty. Okay, so let's go to a passage that is directly relevant. Okay, so let's talk about um, this passage. This is called uh, The Unquenchable Fire and Undying Worms. This is from Isaiah 66. So the final book of the book of Isaiah, or sorry, the final chapter of the book of Isaiah provides a picture of um, eschatological judgment or end times judgment. And you can see immediately the difference between the two. The first line here, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. So already it's, it's directly saying new heavens, new earth. This is post-judgment, post-resurrection, all of that. So it's directly relevant. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go out and look at the dead bodies of the people who have rebelled against me, for their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. 
What makes this directly relevant is uh, Jesus picks up some of this imagery in his discussions on hell uh, from Mark chapter 9, saying, If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Or uh, here it's rendered uh, Gehenna. That'll be relevant here in a second. Where, and he quotes directly from Isaiah 66, where their worm never dies and the fires never quit, quenched. Now, interpreters agree universally that this passage from Isaiah has in view the infamous Valley of Hinnom, which you can see this is a map of uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the Valley of Hinnom is right there. Um, this was a physical location known to, the place, known to be a place of great idolatry. For example, in 2 Chronicles 23.8, King Ahaz sacrifices his children uh, to the uh, god Moloch um, in, in this valley. Uh, elsewhere, the prophet Jeremiah gives an oracle that God will visit this valley with such a violent judgment that it will be renamed from the Valley of Hinnom to the Valley of Slaughter in Jeremiah 7. Um, the Hebrew term for Valley of Hinnom was later Hellenized into the Greek term Gehenna, which is a term that Jesus uses on numerous occasions to describe hell, in particular Mark chapter 9. And so as you can see from this map here, uh, this valley was outside the city of Jerusalem. Um, and you could honestly spend, like we could spend several hours talking just about this imagery. Uh, the Jeru the Jerusalem-Gehenna divide um, is used many times throughout scripture to provide this illustration of the kingdom of heaven and the banishment of those uh, who do not wish to be citizens therein. It's possibly even the imagery that's evoked in Jesus' parable of the wedding guests that are cast out into outer darkness from uh, Matthew 22. The idea being that if you cast someone outside of Jerusalem, the only place that they could really go would be the Valley of Hinnom. You can also see Revelation 21 uh, for more on that Jerusalem imagery uh, where the prophet says that he sees, um, the, uh, uh, um, he sees a new heaven and a new earth and the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Anyway, that, that's a nice aside on Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. Again, we, we could spend a whole lot of time there. But let's get back to uh, the original chapter, Isaiah 66, and get back to our views of hell. So first, there are two references that we have here. Uh, remember our metaphors. So we have um, the dead bodies and we have the fire and the worms. So the conditionalist, the conditionalist is going to argue that the referent of the dead bodies describes the fate of the condemned as just that. They're deceased, except the image is heightened for this is a pictorial fulfillment of Jesus' warning, don't fear those who can kill only the body, rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna, from Matthew chapter 10. The undying worm reinforces this point as an agent of consumption that devours all flesh of the slain corpses. And likewise, the unquenchable fire consumes everything that it touches. This is reinforced by other passages describing God as a consuming, unquenchable fire, quote, reducing to nothing whatever it touches. See, for example, Deuteronomy 4, Hebrews 12, Ezekiel 20, Amos 5. I think I've got those listed on your handout. In short, Isaiah 66 takes all of this imagery together and pictures the fate of the condemned in the sense of obliteration of life and being. And furthermore, this is the same sense that is carried into the teachings of Jesus. Uh, in Matthew 3, Luke 3, uh, Matthew 12, and Mark 9. Okay, any questions about uh, that interpretation? Just understanding it. We'll, we'll critically evaluate it in a minute, but does everyone kind of understand what's going on with this picture? Okay, cool. So with all this language of destruction, obliteration, reducing to nothing, how exactly do we get a picture of eternal conscious torment out of that? Well, the torment interpretation kind of just takes this as, um, oh, whoops, sorry, I skipped, skipped something there. Um, so the torment interpreters, they typically take this passage as a generic allegory for God's wrath. Um, while the language of uh, this passage was then later developed and added upon. So to quote, for example, Daniel Block, who's an uh, evangelical uh, Old Testament scholar, he says, while Isaiah himself may not have had in mind hell as we later learn about it, it was a small and natural step for Jesus and later New Testament writers to utilize Isaiah's image uh, for their own purposes. There are uh, other advocates would point to the apocryphal book of Judith, uh, which, sorry, or deuterocanonical canonical book, depending on your persuasion, uh, that passage refers to fire and worms that cause pain forever uh, in Judith 16, uh, 17. So possibly you have uh, Isaiah that was written, has this imagery of fire and worms. You have Judith that was written after that, says that these fire and worms cause pain forever. Then you have Jesus who then takes the Judith imagery and not the Isaiah imagery. Um, other interpreters such as G.K. Beale, he just says up front, look, Isaiah 66, its usage in the New Testament, it fits whatever view you wanna take. It, it's not really predicted one way uh, or another. Okay. So with that in mind, um, I think I cut that, okay. Uh, are there any comments or questions on this passage and both of those interpretations? Yes. 
Uh, so is the, the idea with the conditionalism, is that, uh, like is it a sharp cutoff when the person is finally obliterated or is there like a degradation of being? So this is a good question where it, it, it ends up with that, it ends up with that issue of what, what biblical writers mean by like destruction and obliteration and what is sort of philosophically meant by that. Uh, so, for example, a biblical author would say that, like, a, a, a corpse that is both dead, so it's been slain, it's then been completely reduced to what we, we in the modern age would call it atoms, right? They've been reduced all the way down to atoms. Does it truly cease to exist in the sense of, like, a philosophical sense? Well, technically, no. It's only undergone a sort of, you know, material transformation there. Um, and so that's where I think you have to make kind of an inference to say the author is trying to communicate that, the imagery that we have in our material world of like complete and total obliteration insofar as there can be obliteration in the material world, uh, that is carried over in an even stronger sense in a sort of holistic way, if that makes sense. Some people say you'll never find a scripture that says things cease to exist. And I, and I mean, like, yeah, they don't cease to exist because I don't think we really see in our material world things ceasing to exist in the sense that the atoms literally stop existing. If that makes sense. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, just one clarification question. On the conditionalist interpretation, would they have some sort of maybe a punishment or some sort of process of ah. that is painful and therefore requiring some justice? This, this is, is what, yeah, this is a very, yeah, very good clarification here. So, we'll get into this more when we get to the philosophical part, but when it comes to this view, punishment does not equal torment. Um, punishment on the conditionalist view is death. The soul that sins shall die. Um, the wages of sin is death. And death is then understood in the conditionalist sense as obliteration of life and being, is, is how that makes sense. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, cool. All right, so I want to build off this point that uh, I said earlier, um, what Block said. Isaiah himself may not have had in mind hell as we later learn about it. So this is something that I I'm, I'm, can kind of take a macro view. Conditionalists are typically forward arguing um, exegetes. In other words, they start with the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible rather, and then they argue forward, saying that references to earlier uh, events take precedence over later ones. Whereas the torment view, uh, at least I've, I've noticed, are typically backwards arguers. They typically start um, as Christians saying, you know, the New Testament is an inspired commentary on the Old Testament, so, or again, the Hebrew Bible, I should say, and the uh, passages that we see in the New Testament ought to be the control for the ambiguities of the Old Testament. So because of that, the passages of Revelation 14 and Revelation 20 are highly contentious in this debate. In fact, I, I would dare say, if, if the book of Revelation were not written, this debate would probably not happen, um, and it would probably not even have the level of controversy that it does today. But Revelation chapter 14, um, verse 9 through 11, has this passage here, saying, uh, Another angel, a third, followed them, crying uh, with a loud voice, Those who worship the beast in its image will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast. Later in Revelation 20, um, The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet uh, were, and they will be tormented day and night forever. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So these passages in Revelation here pose a unique interpretive difficulty because they come from an apocalyptic book. L literally, the name of the book is The Apocalypse of John. And it's stuffed to the brim with symbolic language. Again, not only symbolic, but symbolic as in referring back to the Old Testament. Um, so consider, for example, just in these two passages, the, we're talking about targets and reference. The list of reference that we're uh, asked to interpret include the beast, the lamb, the devil, the false prophet, death, capital, as in death itself, as in the abstract concept of death personified, Hades, the lake of fire, and the book of life. It's like seven independent things that each one of those would take you know, hundreds of hours to truly interpret uh, accurately. In fact, just answering the question, who is the beast of Revelation, is an enormously complicated question. Um, and we're not going to get into that at all. Um, but our focus is going to be primarily on this line, the smoke that rises forever and the torment uh, day and night. 
So the Tormentalist view uh, is going to take these pictures pretty literally, building off of an earlier Old Testament passage, uh, Daniel chapter 12, which says, Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so the assumption is that there's this you know, dual resurrection at the end of time. These resurrected bodies are not destroyed, uh, they're not obliterated, um, and thus uh, they will experience torment in their banishment from the presence of God. I mean, there's not really much else to say other than that. So I think it's pretty straightforward. They just take it kind of literally. So the bulk of, it seems like the bulk of the exegetical work is going to be on the conditionalist. How can you look, like we said earlier, how can you look at dead bodies, fire and worm and see torment? Well, how can you see torment and not see torment? So let's go through uh, this one. So this is a very, for the purpose of today, kind of a long pathway, but I want you to follow as, as best you can uh, to appreciate the complexity of this debate. So the conditionalist points out that this conclusion is way too hasty. Anytime you just point to a verse in Revelation and say, it says it right there, you should immediately stop and say, no, this is the most difficult book to interpret in the entire Bible. Moreover, the author of Re Revelation elsewhere uses the same terminology in a way that is not consistent with eternal torment. So chapters 18 and 19, for example, describe the judgment of the city Babylon. Again, interpretive difficulties abound as to what exactly Babylon or who Babylon is. But as follows in, in Revelation chapter 18, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning, and they will stand afar off in fear of her torment and say, alas, the great city, her, uh, your hour of judgment has come, and her smoke goes up forever and ever. This phrase, smoke going up forever and ever, has roots again in the Old Testament, in particular Isaiah's judgment of the city of Edom. From Isaiah 34, night and day the fire of Edom shall not be quenched, its smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste, no one shall pass through it forever and ever. Clearly, the city of Edom is not literally burning to this day, making Isaiah's turn of phrase actually a better, sense in, uh, a better fit in the sense of obliteration. And the same goes for the judgment of the city of Tyre in uh, Ezekiel 26. In fact, Revelation 18 concludes this whole city of Babylon judgment with an interpreting angel uh, appropriating the language of Ezekiel saying, uh, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down and will be found no more. So it is with those who are cast into the lake of fire. Again, utter destruction of life and being, not endless torture. So this is one of those cases where uh, the, the picturesque uh, you know, uh, thing that's going on in Revelation even though the term torment is used elsewhere in the book of Revelation, the author uses torment in the sense of destruction. Okay. So that's, again, that's, you can see the tormentalist kind of is like, look, it just says torment, dude. And the conditionalist is saying, well, actually, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. You've got to read this in parallel. You've got to compare how the author's actually using it. Okay. Any comments or questions about this particular passage? Are you going to eventually talk about what is just? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I have, I have my rationale, trust me. Um, there was the other verse that's brought up when, at the very beginning of this passage, Matthew uh, 14, I uh, forgot. Yeah. Let me, let me see if it's on the handout. 14, 25. <laughs> the 24, 25. 10, 10 28? Sure. What, what was it? What was the subject of it? It was at the very beginning, I'm sorry. I think it was Matthew like 10, 25 or something like that. Oh, was 16. We can move on. Okay. Any other comments or questions about this passage here? Yes. So I heard uh, one view once that the being being thrown into the smoke and into the fire is actually the angels. Mm -hmm. Do you care to comment on that? Like, are most theologians pretty sure that it is the people in question? Um, so in general, yeah, another complicated question there, interpretive question. The general idea is the fate, in most, most interpreters would say, the fate of the beast, the false prophet, is the same as the fate for those who follow them. Now, some universalists would quibble with that, um, but that's, that's the general idea. Okay. Also, whether or not there's an equivalent between rejecting Jesus' kingship and worshiping the beast. Right, yeah, so the idea, yeah, exactly, the idea being in, in the book of Revelation that, uh, well, I'll, I'll just tell you for, <laughs> yeah, funny. Yeah, it, in general, the, the beast is usually taken as uh, earthly governments that stand in opposition to, uh, to Christ. Okay, 
So that is a lot of Bible that I, I hope everyone's drowning in Bible verses. All right. So let me just kind of conclude uh, the exegetical analysis here. So this very short survey of like three verses uh, hardly scratches the surface. In fact, we'd probably need like an atomic force micrometer to really detect our, microscope. yeah, microscope. Sorry, not micrometer. Sorry. Same thing. Oh, I'm a little tired. So, and honestly, if time permitted, I would really just want to talk only about the Bible uh, and Second Temple literature and things like that. But we, as Ada pointed out, we need to eventually talk about justice and return to the objection. Um, so I think the main point of all of this is that we've seen there's at least on the surface prima facie scriptural warrant for either of these views of hell, either a view of hell that ends in destruction and obliteration of being or a view of hell that ends in eternal torment. So to quote the New Testament scholar Ben Witherington III, I have to be honest and say either view is possible and equally orthodox. If I were a betting man, which I'm not, I would probably bet the conditionalist view is closer to the truth, but I don't know that I can really be sure about that when the evidence is so uh, imagaic and so metaphorical. And that kind of reflects my own view, you know, to sort of let you in behind the, the curtain here. I, I really, these arguments are so eesh, dense. Okay. So with that in mind, let's return now to the philosophical analysis. Did Sam have a comment? No. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's return back to this. So this whole thing was just focused on this first question of hell is an infinite punishment equally administered to all the condemned. That is debatable because clearly this has in view the eternal torment, view, uh, the eternal torment uh, interpretation. Um, so let's see here. Sorry, I kind of got out of... Yeah. Um, but that may not actually be the case. So first, it, it assumes the eternal torment view. Secondly, it assumes um, what Jonathan Quanvig has labeled the retribution thesis. So we're actually going to totally change gears. We're not going to talk about the Bible for like the rest of this uh, period. So <laughs> no more Bible for, for the time being. Okay, so the retribution thesis, uh, Quanvig defines this as the justification for hell is retributive in nature, hell being constituted to mete out punishment to those whose earthly lives and behavior warrant it. So I'll refer to this as retribution or RT or something to that effect. Now, importantly, this retribution thesis is neither presupposed nor entailed by any particular view of hell, universalism included, nor um, or because you can find advocates and you can find detractors in who subscribe to all different views of the nature of hell. However, the eternal torment plus retribution pairing has been, frankly, the majority report of Christianity since at least 553 AD. Um, so we're going to survey some of the classic uh, philosophical defenses of this pairing. All right, the Thomists in the room rejoice. We turn to uh, the Summa Theologia. Okay, so the argument, like seriously, like the classic argument in philosophical defense of eternal torment is what's referred to as the status argument. It is articulated here by Thomas Aquinas, we'll go over in a minute, um, it is defended by Jonathan Edwards, Francis Turretin, John Calvin, the rest of your classic uh, Reformation scholars. Like this is a major big deal that's endorsed across, um, at, least, at least in the West, uh, all streams of Christianity. So I think it's worth really taking a look at. Okay, so Aquinas directly answered this question uh, in the Prima Secunda of the Summa Theologia, question 87, part four. Quote, whether sin incurs a debt of punishment infinite in quantity. So I'm just going to read it directly because I think it's important to hear what he has to say. So he starts by saying the gravity of a sin increases according to the greatness of the person sinned against. For example, it is, more grievous, it is a more grievous sin to strike the sovereign than a private individual, and God's greatness is infinite. Now, as a quick note for our Thomists, uh, this is, of course, in the objection part of it. It's not actually Thomas's view, but... It doesn't seem like he refutes this view uh, later, so I think it's safe to infer that this is his own view. Now, in the Respondeo, he says, I answered that punishment is proportionate to sin. Now, sin comprises two things. First, there is the turning away from the immutable good, which is infinite. Wherefore, in this respect, sin is infinite. Second, since there, uh, there is the inordinate turning to mutable good, in this respect, sin is finite, both because the mutable good itself is finite and because the movement of turning towards its finite, it, it toward that, yeah, sorry, because the movement of turning towards it is finite, since the acts of a creature cannot be infinite. Accordingly, insofar as sin consists in turning away from something, its corresponding punishment is the pain of loss, which is also infinite. Because it is the loss of the infinite good, i.e. God, but insofar as sin turns inordinately to something, its corresponding punishment is the pain of sense, which is also finite. So in other words, 
sort of a rough and ready idea here is that whenever we're talking, we, we, we talked about how, you know, we're talking about finite sins and things like that. That's sort of your, like your day-to-day -day sort of, you know, like you're stealing things and you're lying and doing things like that. But Aquinas is saying here that actually behind all of that stands fundamentally a rejection, not just of finite goods, such as honesty, but of the infinite good, which is God himself. And so if you agree that rejection of finite goods entails finite punishment, then rejection of uh, an infinite good should entail an infinite punishment. Okay. I think that was a faithful interpretation of Aquinas. That last sentence there seems hugely important because he says uh, sin turns inordinately to something that's corresponding. Punishment is the pain of sense, which is also finite. So that seems like finite punishment. Oh. And pain of loss, which is infinite, which could correspond to, if you said they were annihilated, that would be an infinite Well, I, let, let me make one other important, important comment about this, um, which I should have set up at the front, and the reason why we're starting with Aquinas. For Aquinas, and for, uh, especially for dogmatic Catholics, annihilationism or whatever, obliteration, whatever you want to call it, is a no-go, because in Aquinas's view, God's actually reducing something to non-existence is itself an evil act. So that's an, a very important clarification, and that's why I turn to Aquinas, because he's very much not going to go that route. So. I see many hands. Uh, if you were to take the principle in isolation. Yeah, yes. What, what was your name? I, I don't know. Uh, Harrison. Harrison. So, I'm sorry. I have to like, accept the Catholics. What was your... Yes, Catholic. Tell me. Um, <laughs> so, what were you trying to say about it being finite? You know, uh, about between the last conversation. Uh, as sin turns inordinately to something, its corresponding punishment is the pain of sense, which is also finite. So... Pain, right, uh, so it should be important. Like this question is talking about how much we pain we are receiving as punishment at any given moment. It's not discussing time in any way. Uh, or it, it is kind of discussing time, but the important thing he's trying to focus on is not if the time of torment is infinite, which he would, uh, and actually, in the first objection, it says... Um, so it says, further, a thing may be infinite in two ways, in duration and in quantity. And he's talking about quantity, not duration. Now, the punishment of infinite is, is infinite in duration. And he does not refute that. So he's saying it is infinite in duration. He's talking about in how much at any given moment, you might say. Okay. I think we can skip there. So that. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah, what was oh, your name? I, I think I just might point out what's kind of interesting about okay. the pain of... Oh, Christianos. Um, what's interesting about what St. Thomas Aquinas is doing there, as he usually does, is he's um, actually trying to weave together two traditions that aren't actually explicitly stated. So we can think about like um, like classical lines, like burning in their lusts in like Roman, Romans 1, 19, 120, um, for trading natural relations with one each other. Um, and in the Catholic tradition, there's this idea of like the burning of the senses. Mm -hmm. um, and so St. Jerome and St. Augustine sometimes talk about like the fire of hell, like the burning of concupiscence, the, the, the burning and the loss of the purification of, of heart and knowing God. Um, is that actually what that finite attack the senses are? So he's trying to make those things complementary and weave it into that general philosophical argument he has. Mm -hmm. Because if the pain is coming from your own senses and your own passions, then it would be finite because you're a finite being. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody not buy this argument? I don't really buy the fact that it's a finite punishment, there, that it views hell as sort of a finite punishment in the sense that pain is a finite thing, simply because of the fact that it goes on for an infinite amount of time, I think you have to view that as a whole. Mm -hmm. But the status argument, it does seem sort of to correspond with what you read in Romans and things like that, where there's no one righteous, and so no one is justified, and you know, mm -hmm. God can't be with those who are not perfect, mm -hmm. because he is infinite, and going against him is infinitely wrong. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, well, I'm going to uh, just report a couple of objections, not endorsing them necessarily. I'm, again, I'm not going to tell you if I agree with this argument or not. But um, here are at least some concerns that are articulated against this, because I think it's fair that we at least, you know, look at some things that are, that are bad. 
So first of all, uh, and, and the two main things come down to this. The transfinite arithmetic here is very suspicious. Um, when you start talking about infinite this and infinite that and infinite whatevers, things start to get really wonky really fast. So for example, a lot of people, and I don't know necessarily if Aquinas holds to this, but the sort of idea is since hell is unending, uh, on this view of course, we're still assuming the eternal torment view. Since hell is unending, that means that it's an actually infinite amount of uh, you know, punishment that is administered. But that's actually not the case uh, in the sense of duration, because any amount of punishment that is administered or you know, torment or whatever you want to call it, a person who is in hell or being tormented for you know, 10 years, a billion years, it doesn't matter. They're never actually closer to reaching actual infinity on that point. So if the assumption is that uh, justice demands an, an actually infinite punishment, an actually infinite punishment cannot be administered by successive addition in this sense. So there may be some ways around that. You may could say that it's infinite in quality, or what I prefer to say uh, um, for defenders of this view, there's just an easy out. You just relabel, get rid of the term infinite altogether, just use the term maximal. God is of maximal worth. Uh, rejection of him is, is, uh, ma incurs maximal guilt. Um, maximum guilt requires maximum uh, punishment. And if you believe that the punishment is torment, then maximal punishment is unending term, uh, torment. That seems to do an end run around all those logical issues. But the second issue is actually more fundamental. That may be a nice patchwork on the whole transfinite ar arithmetic thing, but why is it that the status of the offended is more important than the status of the offender? So there's a common, um, uh, in the literature, there's a counterintuition that's offered. I've adapted it for my uh, current use. They talk about Schweitzer. I don't think anybody here knows who Schweitzer is. Well, maybe a few of you do, but I don't, I don't think it's very relevant. In general, the idea is when we talk about uh, crimes that are committed by people, depending on the type of person that commits that crime, that affects the gravity of the crime. So for example, the evangelical community was ensconced in a lot of controversy and vo you know, vocal hypocrisy over the sort of uh, sexual misconducts between you know, Donald Trump in 2016 and Ravi Zacharias most recently in 2018 or so. In one case, Donald Trump was like, oh, well, you know, it's fine. You know, he's a serial adulterer, but we knew that. You know, he's a playboy. You know, we knew that about him. Him doing that, not a big deal. Ravi Zacharias being a well-known, well-respected person. Oh my goodness, he's an adulterer. Oh, this is terrible. This is awful. It's worthy of lament. The idea being that the intuition there is in the opposite direction. They did essentially the same crime or the same sin, as it were, and yet one person is like, yeah, well, we knew that about him. We're not voting for Pope. And then the other, it's like, hmm, that's, that seems worse somehow. Whether you agree with that or not, uh, the point is that there appears to be some type of intuition that maybe the status of the offended is not the only thing that is relevant. So just some considerations on that. I don't think they're not knockdown arguments, but they are at least uh, mitigating arguments. Okay. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip past uh, this one and just get to the last one. Wow, why did I do it this way? Oh, was there a comment on, on that? Well, just, yeah, the question, uh, with the maximum layer handled, how would the more Aquinas type uh, answer cover the fact that if the infinite punishment isn't actually ever achieved, because it goes on forever, then it seems like God wouldn't be just because the infinite punishment yeah, well, isn't really yeah. Right, as Harrison, as Harrison pointed out, it's not necessarily just an infinite in duration. That, that's, where, that's where I'm saying things get really wonky really fast. Because Turretin, which, okay, cards on the table, I, I read more Turretin than I do Aquinas. Turretin makes a similar argument, saying that there's both a, because a, uh, he endorses eternal torment and all that. So he says that there's a pain of loss and a pain of sense. And he says that the sense is a finite uh, pain, but the loss is an infinite pain. And that's how you get around that whole thing. Again, I still think some of that may be subject to some of the transfinite arithmetic stuff, but in any event. Okay, so all that to say, one of the, uh, I do want to just for the sake of time quickly survey one alternative, which is um, the natural consequences of free will. So another Thomist, actually, incidentally, Eleanor Stump, um, realizes her or she, um, Jonathan Quanvig, C.S. Lewis as well, they all sort of struggle with this sort of calculus of dealing with infinite punishments and infinite this and infinite that. It's very weird. So what they do is they actually abandon the retribution thesis. And they say that um, the purpose of hell is not rat retribution, but rather it's an issuance of God's love, which may seem really weird. Um, that's actually what uh, Stump argues. But essentially the idea is that the condemned wish to have nothing to do with God anyway. That remember, remember from what we said, we're talking about a person who has rejected God in every conceivable way possible. And God is respecting that free choice, um, 
to say that. Say, so fine, okay, if you don't want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, then you don't have to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And so God, respecting their free choice, uh, actually quarantines them in a sort of existence away from himself um, so that they can fulfill uh, the fullness of their newly acquired nature. God says, this, the nature that I created you in, you're not fulfilling it. You've acquired a self-made nature. I will respect you according to that nature. That nature can't coexist with me, so you're going to be you know, sort of banished. And that is what the description of hell is. And it's possibly what St. Paul had in mind when he wrote in 2 Thessalonians, these will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, that sort of bears a little bit of uh, intuition there. And what's important is that this thesis, the natural consequence of free will thesis, is consistent with both views. Because you can say that, you can argue essentially, as a stump does, she says, Aquinas cannot, on Aquinas' view, destruction of being is not an option because of certain metaphysical postulates that I'm not gonna spend time getting into. But you can also tell, you can also construe this on a conditionalist view, which is, uh, those that are condemned, they say they reject God actively. They say, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want uh, to be you know, a part of the kingdom of heaven or whatever. I don't want eternal life. And God respecting that allows them to be obliterated and destroyed in, uh, in that sense. Now, uh, we're a little over time, so I'm just going to get to the conclusion quickly, and then we can continue discussion uh, after the fact. So here's our conclusion. So we've surveyed a broad range of questions uh, related to the problem of hell. The exegetical question kind of leaves open at least two, possibly three, viable interpretations. The eternal torment view, which states that God will keep the condemned in existence forever, uh, and the conditional immortality view, which states that God will give the gift of eternal life to whosoever believes, and the condemned will perish by obliteration. Now, pertaining to the philosophical objection as to how finite sins can warrant infinite punishment, this presupposes that the, the purpose of hell is retribution. And so to square the eternal torment retribution thesis, the arguments such as the status argument, um, and there are others, uh, they heavily rely on what may be questionable transfinite arithmetic. Um, and so some, there may be some issue there. But essentially they argue that because God is a... Uh, a being, or he is, he is being beyond, you know, comprehension, it makes rejection of him something different than the types of day-to-day -day sins that we're familiar with. Uh, many philosophers who endorse internal torment um, don't go that route, and instead they favor something like the respective free choice thesis. Uh, for example, C.S. Lewis, Eleanor Stump, and Jonathan Quanvig, um, uh, seeing that it may be philosophically more consistent. So in summary, I think that we have two views that are biblically uh, justifiable, and there are at least some philosophical responses uh, for them. And so for that reason, I don't think that it's um, necessarily warranted to say that the doctrine of hell, however conceived, uh, is, is unjust. So that's my conclusion.